Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hello and welcome to this week's House of Rugby. We have a packed out programme for you tonight in the England corner. It's Marley Packer. But look who it is at the top of the programme. It's only Sean O'Brien and Sam Warburton. Gents, how are you? Great, great. Not a bad Very good, actually. The dream, t- the dream team are back, Lee. The dream team are back. <laughs> we're, back. We're, we're, we're getting the band back together. <laughs> we are... <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear uh, some of your stories later on. But first of all, Sam, I think uh, it's still uh, very appropriate to say to you congratulations on behalf of uh, what Wales did. Sure, I've been like walking the dog lately around uh, Cardiff in Wales and stuff, and I get a lot of people saying, "Oh, Sam, congratulations! How are the celebrations?" I'm like, "I've done nothing for three and a half years. Like, I just, I'm like, I just." Sat on my pants at home watching it like everyone else. <laughs> I think they contribute to the to the win, but I mean it's it's great because I'm not going to lie, I, I didn't see it coming. I don't think anyone did. I, I had to predict what was going to happen, and you can only go off what happened in 2020. And off that, I was mm. like, well, Wales are fourth or fifth in line. So nice, a, a little bit of luck, which which helped them in the first few games at the rub of the green. And I thought they actually played the one game they lost. I actually thought they played best in against France. Um, but I mean, I take it as a Welsh fan. I mean, I, I was delighted. So it was, um, yeah, a, ni- a nice result for us. I'm kind of pleased you weren't singing your pants because you were on BBC television alongside me for some of it. And six million people tuned in on Friday night. A couple of big Friday night matches. Um, I've sat beside you in studios and stadiums. And I think actually you're quite calm in comparison to some other people that I've sat beside as an ex-player. Um, but the nerves must have been pretty high the past couple of Fridays. Do you know what? It's really weird. Like when I'm, I was the same as a player. I never found it like too emotional playing. I mean, I always got nervous and anxious and stuff like that. And when you played in the game, obviously it meant the world to you. But uh, watching, I'm pretty calm. I don't know whether without getting too deep. Like I mean, it's a game of rugby at the end of the day, and there's much worse things that can happen than a loss, and you do get wrapped up in it emotionally a bit. But to be honest, that Wales had ex- exceeded my my. Um, my expectations anyway so I just thought well they, they've done well regardless if they lost the French game and I knew they still had a chance to win the championship I still backed them to win the championship even if they lost to France so you know every, every cloud um, I guess but no I, I am pretty calm to watch like Jamie Roberts who was next to me was going nuts but he's still playing so he's still kind of like quite close yeah. to that playing action but once you've stopped playing for like for me it's already been three and a half knocking on four years you can kind of emotionally detach yourself from it you know so um I guess if I was watching from home, I might be a little bit more emotional because I guess you're kind of in, you are in work mode when you're in the studio because you've got to, you're watching the game black and white. You're not really watching it as a fan. You've got to pick up on all the stuff straight away in the studio after the final whistle. So yeah, I kind of have my, my work hat on, I guess. We had, the two, we had the two boys on last week, Foxy and uh, Dan, and the two of them, did, all they done was whinge on the show. Who, 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 Foxy? Who, sorry? For, da, big, bigs, Dan. bigs and Foxy. Yeah, come on, did he? I didn't yeah, watch that. Yeah. And, 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 and the two of them did nothing but whinge about if the French, if the French get the result they wanted at the weekend. <laughs> oh. But it, it, it worked out, it worked out well for them anyway, in the end, thankfully. So... <laughs> Did enjoy so Fox, the, I'm guessing Fox is not on this one because we're going to be chatting about Lions and stuff and he sort of wanted to dip out of that one, did he? Oh, he didn't. He's he didn't want quiet. to talk about Lions. He didn't <laughs> want to talk about Lions. He's busy. He's suddenly really busy. <laughs> um, Sam, you, you mentioned sort of how surprised you were with where Wales started maybe 12 months ago to where they've finished now. But let's not forget, for a part of last year, you were actually part of the, the coaching team as well. So what has changed, really, do you think, really, in the sort of last six months? Because just before the Autumn Nations Cup, I think it was, was that correct? That's round about then you sort of decided that to, to step out of that. What is the difference? Yeah, for me, in a nutshell, I, I, just, I just didn't want to coach, you know. I thought... It was kind of an emotional decision to go back straight back in with the national team because like, my, my career kind of finished kind of pretty bluntly. So I jumped back into the national team and, like, you know, you know, coach, there are coaches out there who have been applying their trade for 10, 15 years and they get nowhere near an international setup. And I thought, oh, wow, what, a, what an opportunity. I only done my level one, like coaching badge. I, I didn't anticipate I was going to ever coach, but I give it a go. There were some parts of it I really enjoyed that I loved. And there's other parts of it the same reasons why I finished really like the time away particularly with COVID you're going to be bubbling up a lot and I just had a newborn baby in August and I thought oh this is actually not very good timing for me so that was why I left the coaching 
But I just think, like, when I was there, though, like, getting Jenkins coming in as defence coach, I always thought he was destined to be a defence coach. Jonathan Emfries, really good coach. Stephen Jones, really good coach. Neil Jenkins, brilliant coach. And Pivak's obviously got his experience of winning the Pro Bowl team with the Scarlet. So I thought it was a really good setup there, but it just wasn't for me. So I guess I'm kind of being a bit hypocritical because in some ways I was surprised, but in other ways, when I know the guys who were driving it behind closed doors. I'm not because I know how good they are. And like, you know, Sean Lee's worked with Neil Jenkins on, on Lions tours. And like, he, for me, is a phenomenal coach. Like, real eye on working behind closed doors, the detail he has to Wales' strategy, kicking game, and his input elsewhere. But... Um, yeah, they got a good coaching team there. So it's, and I said two things had to happen going into the Six Nations campaign for Wales. Number one was they needed to have some emerging young players to step up because 2020 was a quiet year for emerging players. Like, yeah, guys come off the bench, but I mean, really grabbing a first 15 shirt and making it their own. And we had guys like Louis Samet, you know, doing that and making an impact. And secondly was the Lions boys, and I think they'd admit this themselves, they were much quieter than normal in 2020, but this year, guys like Alan Wynn, George North, Tipperick, Faletau, Liam Williams, you know, John Davis, they all played much, much better. Um, and, and that had a massive impact on and Dan Bigger. That, that had a massive impact on the outcome of the game. So I think the main thing Wales had was their senior players really sort of stepped up this campaign, which which perhaps last year they were a bit quieter. So that was a big difference. I think that combined is why they managed to get, you know, another Six Nations title. I, I think as well, looking at Wales, time. Like when Pivac came in, obviously, t- teams need to adapt differently to different coaches. And as Sam knows, because he's been there, it's it's different. There's different ideas. And it's, it's you, you don't just click your fingers and a different idea happens on the field. And it's quite like Ireland are at the minute. You only see the very last game, you see what Ireland were about in terms of the style they want to try and play now. They were moving England, moving the point of attack in England, moving them around the place, not trying to physically match them because it's, it's next to near impossible for Ireland because they're not a big side. So it takes time to de, to evolve these new game plans and new coaching setups and and for everyone to get their stamp on a setup. And I think I think Wales have done that brilliantly now. When you when you just see their overall game, all the little bits and pieces were really good throughout the championship. Yeah, I, I gotta to add to that. Like you know, if you're a club coach, you've got, you know, a couple of months, three months to get your team together. But, Longest, you, you know, club coach be given three years, and they have twelve months a year with that team. Where, when you're international setup, you've got you know five six games is six months, you know, and you know it's not you know you don't you get judged on five six games at a club coach. You can bang five six games out in five weeks, and you know no one bats an eyelid. Are you still building? But if you lose five games at international level, and you know the the shepherd's up comes down, you know, and the guillotine comes down, so it, it's ruthless. But that's just the cutthroat environment of international coaching and coaches would know that when people ask Wayne Pivak oh, do you feel under pressure he knows if he's not going to win he's going to be under pressure so he's like yeah of course I knew that you know and you know what elite sportsman doesn't go through pressure like you know, surely you would have been through a million times at Leinster at European level Ireland at World Cups and Grand yeah. Slams like Lions tours like well, pressure is perfectly normal and like that's what brings the best out your best competitors thrive off that mm. and that's what your international coaches are. So in their heads, when you're asking an international coach on pressure, they're laughing. Well, of course, of course, you know, yeah, that's part of the game, yeah. you know? But uh, yeah, that, that's just expected. Sam, we both worked on the Autumn Nations Cup and at times that felt a bit of a hard sell. I mean, some of the matches were a bit of a slog. But I just wonder, <laughs> because we almost went from that, it was still a competitive tournament, almost straight into a Six Nations, which was a phenomenal Six Nations. I mean, some of the matches were just incredible to watch. Do you think that one thing led to the other? I mean, what, how can rugby change so much over the space of a few months? Uh, do you know what? I don't know. The answer is I don't know. The autumn was... Um, it was it, Every game was like a game of chess in the autumn. Yeah. And if anything, it should be the other way around because it's a bit more experimental. Although there's the Autumn Nations Cup, but you know, let's, not, let's be honest, you're not going to lose sleep if you don't win that. But if you don't win the Six Nations, yeah, it bothers you. It's, everything's about the Six Nations from an international point of view. And because like, there, there it was brilliant, there was no crowds. Like, could you imagine if, like, in some of those games, you had 8,000 in there? Like, it would have been phenomenal. It, would, it was great to tell you anyway. But I just think when, when you've got competition, everything is heightened by, by, by 10, magnified by 10. Every referee decision, you know, every poor kick, every missed tackle is like, is under the microscope at that level, you know, when you get away with it at the club level a bit, 
maybe their automations kept that intensity and naturalism there. It's just human nature. But when you've got Six Nations time, it's mad. And it just shows that you don't really need crowd. Well, I guess surely it'd be better this week than this because I haven't played in the environments at the minute with no crowds. But I imagine even with Six Nations, yeah, it would be different. But when you're sticking on like a, a Six Nations jersey and say, I'm, I'm playing Ireland for Wales, like, geez, I don't need 80,000 people to get me up for that. You know, you get up mm. for that anyway as a player. So, but the honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know how the contrast and styles change in two or three months. It was, you normally have one or two upsets in the Six Nations. I remember going into the championship, like, there's going to be a couple of upsets which none of us predict, but there's about five or six, yeah. which was, makes it great to watch. Yeah. But yeah, the honest answer is, the change in styles, no idea. I think maybe the braver teams, more experienced teams, were more willing to take those risks, and it, and it perhaps paid off in certain in certain games because you have to. You know, now you you've got to score twenty points, so you've got to aim to score twenty points to win a game now. Because yeah, defenses are tough, but like I know it's like Wales, they were getting over twenty. Like they, you back Wales to score three tries every game now, so opposition know they have to do the same when they're playing Wales you know you've got to get 20 points in the bag so it kind of opens up the game for, for minute one I guess a little bit more So Sean from your point of view and I'll start with you and then we'll ask Sam who stood out um, on this Six Nations Championship for you who put their hands up not necessarily for Lions but just kind of arrived um, Who arrived obviously Lewis Ree Samet I think he's arrived now and settled into that test arena um, phenomenally well. Um, who else? I think uh, some of the Scottish boys kind of mm -hmm. fronted up, I suppose, every week, some of them. Um, and then you look at some of the French players, you know, DuPont, I know that we've talked about him before, but he is just on a different level, that, that man at the minute. Um, and I think, I think in Ireland, for instance, uh, Hugo Keenan, Something like he hasn't been talked about, but he played every single minute in the Six Nations and didn't put, didn't drop a ball, didn't do anything out, out of character. Um, so he's kind of come into the picture now as a, an established international fullback, and no one's really, really talked about him. To be fair, yeah. um, so there's there's been a few, but I think I think a lot of the teams, as Sam has said earlier, that those younger guys have come in now and. And really established themselves and settled into that uh, that kind of test environment. Um, I don't think Eng England are the only ones that really didn't bring in anyone uh, really new this 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 campaign. Um, although they probably should have, um, where they've ended up. So <laughs> we can both have a good laugh at that. But um, there's there's I suppose they need to they need to look at that and and breeding a, a bit of fresh blood in there. I think um, as I've said as I've stated before, but. Um, in the forwards then, who have you got in the forwards? Uh, I can't really think of anyone offhand there. I suppose Ryan Bird from, from Ireland. Um, yeah. Is, you know, it's his first Six Nations Championship. He's fast, he's physical. Um, I kind of think he could be a late bolter for the Lions as well if he's, uh, he's a good year. What do you think about Ty Burns, Sean? I thought he impressed me in the back row and, he, and I think he's got a great shot because he covers... Yeah, he covers... Yeah. It, just so good, it makes him for me pretty much a banker to, to go on that tour. Would you believe when we when Tig was with Leinster, I, I used to hate training <laughs> against him because he was one of these lads that was an absolute pain in the hole. I swear to God, he used to frustrate me so much. He'd be lying <laughs> lying on the wrong side, holding you in rooks, doing all these things that wanted that you want a young fella to do with training. Um, he was so competitive. And he's just really come into his own now as well. So he has been unbelievable. He's probably someone though that I expect that from now with his performances for, with Munster. Um, but I suppose cementing his place in the Ireland team now. And he can play anywhere, as you've said, Sam. He can play six, seven. Uh, the only place that I wouldn't be so comfortable with him is eight probably. But he can cover the second row. Um, and he has, he's, he's, he's just showing up every single time. And he has been that pain in the hole for, for oppositions. Um, he's one of those lads who you'd love to thump when you're, when you're training against him. Um, and he's been, he's been brilliant. And I said, I, I put up a post last week. I just said, this fella is, is playing some stuff at the minute. Um, so he's, he's definitely in the picture, I think now in, in Gats's plans, I'd say. Yeah. We're going to talk about the Lions a little bit later. Sam, who would be your player of the tournament? Oh, oh that's a good one. Uh, I mean, they're the it, ones that the Six Nations have put forward. Uh, put forward. Yeah. Um, 
Talupi Falatau, Lewis Rees Samet from Wales, Robbie Henshaw, Tag Byrne was one of them. Uh, who else am I missing? Dupont was one, and Hamish Watson was the other. So I suppose if we stick with those six. Yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I was going to go outside of that six, to be honest. Oh, uh, go outside. I just thought he, he was a. I watch back rows like a hawk, and maybe I'm biased because my eye naturally goes to a back row when I watch games, you know. But I thought shining light in England's team was Tom Curry. Um, and I think if you, I, sorry to jump to Lions, but I, I just think he is one of the shoe ins for me. Just stand up shoe in. Um, I guess we, we'll come on to this a little bit later, but that's what makes the leadership so difficult from Lions because all the leaders aren't shoe ins at the minute um, in the starting 15. There's about four guys who are shoe ins who haven't got captaincy experience, but he's one of them. I just thought he'd br- every game, Hamish Watson, I agree, was fantastic. Louis Samet in attack was brilliant. It definitely was was brilliant in attack. But you know, I'm gonna go with Curry. I just I, I don't see a game he doesn't have an impact. Never. Mm. Like he always has a massive impact in defence at the breakdown. For you know he's kind of like you, Shawnee. Like he carries unusually unusually well for for a seven. You know he's really comfortable doing that, and he can get up in the air in lineup time. I just think if you're picking a, a team now, he's a, he's a shoot. He get in anyone's team at the minute mm. out of the home nations and and. Italy and France, so I go with Tom Curry. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably agree with him. I'd say Dupont. For me, Dupont, just the way he played throughout the whole tournament was unbelievable. But like behind him is Curry, I think. He hasn't and doesn't have bad games and he's always involved and he's one of the big, big players. And actually, it was quite interesting against Ireland. He was doing a lot of talking to the referee the last day. Um, so I think they're trying to maybe develop him into that kind of, into more of a leadership role. Um, Robbie Henshaw I thought has been phenomenal as well I think he's really yeah. come into come into a bit of form now again um, and then you have the likes of Tips and these boys and Toby like hitting form again real at the right time um, so you know uh, you wouldn't go outside those six but I think I think Dupont for me was the star of the show uh, followed by Curry and then Robbie Henshaw to be fair yeah, good show. Okay, you're whetting our appetite for the Lions chat. That's coming up a little bit later. Uh, for the moment, thanks very much, Sam. Yeah, thanks, Lee. No worries. See you later. Well, the Women's Six Nations kicks off this weekend and the reigning champions, England, take on Scotland in Doncaster. I'm delighted to say that Red Rose's Marley Packer joins us. Marley, it's been a long wait for you, but at last we do have a Six Nations of sorts. It's a different format, but I bet you can't wait to get started. No, not at all. Like, we just chomping at the bit to get out there now. Uh, squad selection comes out tonight to us, so I think we're all still waiting for that. And then, yeah, just can't wait to go. In terms of the atmosphere within this group, what is it like? Because we know you had those matches against France in the autumn, but because it was delayed and then it is a different format, does it still feel special? Does it still feel like a Six Nations? Um, I think it's it is different because the format is is different. But we've got that goal, and we want to go out there and win that Six Nations and retain that trophy. Um, we like to come uh, back to back champions three times over. So uh, that that's the goal. And for myself, uh, I wasn't a part of the, the the Six Nations last year prior to COVID. So for me, I just want to um, get out there and just play play some rugby. Do you think? Do you think, Marley? Do you think that, um, or have you spoken about the way other teams have spent a lot more time together now? Do you know the way the English set up? Like you're, you've quite a great setup, and um, you know the clubs have a great setup and so professional, etc. And now that other countries, let's say, like some of the Irish girls that you may know as well that are playing over here, they've had more time together. Do you think the gap will close? Because when I've watched you, let's say in the Women's World Cup the last time round, you were streaks ahead of everyone in terms of your physicality, your structures, all these bits and pieces. Do you think that gap is going to close now? Like, or have, Are you more aware that other teams would have had a lot more time together than they would have had in, in general now? Yeah, definitely. But I also think that's the same for us. We've still managed to have a lot of time together. Um, yeah. I, I think because of the new format, we're not going to be able to play some of the teams like we would like to, like to, well, depending on who plays in that final match. But... Mm. Uh, I think for us, it's just making sure that whatever teams close the gap, that we make sure that we get that gap bigger again by pushing ourselves. Mm. Yeah, yeah. 
What's the atmosphere um, like just now? Because you're obviously exactly the same as we've been discussing in terms of the men. You're in a bubble. You're in a team hotel. Um, is it is, is that sort of limited when it comes to interaction and seeing each other? Yeah, it's a bit weird, to be fair, but uh, I think it's quite similar to the men. You've got the group of players that like the PlayStation, Xbox and playing cards. And uh, yeah, they're like, oh, we got a WhatsApp group and they're like, oh, anyone dropping in now? So uh, we've got <laughs> groups like that. We've also got a couple of players. They've come into camp and they went for a little shopping trip before. And uh, now they're trying to like open up like their own little shop and sell into players for, you know, uh, 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 evening snack. <laughs> a mark up, to get the mark up on, uh, on yeah, stuff. Yeah, basically. <laughs> like, you get a can of Coke Zero for X amount of money. But, yeah, no, it's quite smart. £12.50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think, like, obviously, it's weird being in a bubble. Uh, we had to drive to train in today all separately in our cars, whereas normally we'd be on a coach together. Yeah. And, like, just that bonding time, we don't have that as before. Uh, but... Being up here in Doncaster, I think it's been up to like 21 degrees today, which has been lovely. Yeah. So we've managed to be outside, um, socially distanced, but being able to like nice. chat and just interact with each other a little bit. Um, and also we've had like skill sessions on, which is uh, it been like good for us. For you personally, though, there is the human element because you've got a little one, uh, yeah. Oliver. I think he's just turned one. <laughs> How tough is it being away from home as a mum? Uh, so Oliver, he so he's actually he's only seven months. Uh, seven it's months. it's really tough to be fair. Uh, rugby's rugby's always been like number one for me. So like anything yeah. else got put on the back burner. Like rugby was first, and that was that's always been my life. But uh, like this this. Last seven months, Oliver comes first before anything else. So being away is mm. is difficult. But my partner Tash, she she supports it, me one hundred percent, and she tries to make my life as like easy as it can be. But uh, give it a couple of nights where I've had a full night's sleep. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go down too yeah. well. Uh, uh, but no. Maybe the it, next it, maybe the next Six Nations could be different for you. <laughs> she yeah. she might be saying, "Hold on a minute, though. I'm I'm not staying here again." <laughs> yeah 100 percent. no but it, it's part and parcel like i like obviously we plan to have oliver and i knew the consequences that i'm still playing for england and i still love my job i love what i do putting on that shirt is probably one of the most amazing things ever so actually one day hopefully he'll be able to look at it and be like oh that was my mum and like be proud of that at the moment he hasn't got a clue but i put him in an england shirt he watches the guys in the six nations it's good <laughs> and you, you use the word job and it absolutely is a job. And I suppose that's where the difference is um, when, you know, I've covered the Women's Six Nations for the last, I don't know, five years or so on the BBC. And there is a marked difference in the sides and Sean touched upon it. But it is so important to close that gap. And that can really only happen when every side is professional or it has as many professional players in it as, as possible. Yeah, most definitely. Like I, I feel for like... They are if you uh, have pulled away, as in managing to get us contracts, um, and it's just been phenomenal for the women's game and to get the, the sponsor in at Allianz Premier 15s. Yeah. The league is is pushing us. Like you've got players here at England camp that are chomping at the bit to go off and play league games because the yeah. the, the the standard that we're playing at now is is second to none. And, like at the weekend, we had a Saracens Harlequins clash, which was which was ended in a draw. But then you come into camp, and there's still like a few bodies, a bit uh, like there's a few clashes still uh, happening. But we just remember England first. But you know, club is club is up there these days. Whereas before, it was always country first. Whereas players want to play for clubs. And tell us a little bit about this uh, new global calendar for women's rugby, WXV. Uh, is that a game changer, do you think, from, from the, the women's game? Yeah, well, I definitely hope so. Um, obviously, 16 teams will be involved in it. And I, and I think with that, like Six Nations, there's obviously only six of us. It's, and that's every year, whereas this is going to be every year. There'll be three tiers, which hopefully then teams are playing teams that it's going to be a competitive match, not just one team's going to come out. But let's see how many points we can not let them score against us, I guess. Um 
like, I, like it's been really exciting. I'm hoping to be a part of it, but who knows? I'm, I'm pushing on a little bit now, and Oliver being at home might not want me to be away so much. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think it's really exciting for the women's game and for the players coming up through. Uh, I, I think the game is just keeps on taking off and taking off. And I remember when I first came into the England set, set up and I was still doing a full-time plumbing job alongside doing this and this was just a hobby. So like for me to be able to call this a job and something I love doing, <clears throat> the younger players coming up through, uh, yeah, it's just, it's incredible for them. Mm -hmm. And just before we let you go, um, you mentioned how many times uh, England have won this competition. Is there any reason to suppose that England aren't going to do it again, this Six Nations? Uh, I, I obviously uh, would like to say, no, we're, we're definitely going to win it. But who, who knows what could happen? Uh, what, what teams, different teams put out, like uh, Sean said, teams are together. So th they can do their analysis. They can try new plays, new trick plays, like things you won't see. We might not turn up one day and there could be a shock result. So I feel like you've just got to literally take each game as it comes. But like, of course, I'm going to say I'll back us. But, you know, who knows what could happen? Love the confidence. I expect Love the confidence. Nothing less. Exactly. exactly. Uh, Marley, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for yours. Cheers, guys. Thanks, for, thanks, thanks. Marley. Well, it's time now to bring Sam back into the chat. Um, we almost touched upon it earlier on when it comes to the Lions, and it has been at the forefront of just about everybody's minds. Uh, the players say it never is at the forefront of their minds, but we all know that they're lying. Um, Sam, what do you think that we have learned over the last, what, eight weeks or so about what this Lions team is going to look like? Yeah, well, this is the thing I've been thinking about because there's been a lot of... Um... I've been seeing loads of posts about you know what the fans have picked yeah. you know through the official Lions and Vodafone channels and that. And I think it's 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 fun and it's great fun. But I think fans are all picking the sexiest players that they know is all the stuff and attack. But you've got to think what what's the team Gatlin's going to pick? You know, mm. like he's he values highly like defensive capabilities in players, um, which I think kind of a lot of fans overlook because they just think of all the stuff which you know the tries and things like that. Um, and, and nice little kicks over the top and things. But you've got to think of which player is going to cope in Johannesburg in, in South Africa against the big old Bocker pack. Like, you know, which player is going to front up for that? And that's, that's, the, that's the players Gatlin's going to pick. I mean, it's great for I think it's definitely shaped. I think, Charles, I've, most people's teams that I've seen, you, you can't really argue with. Everybody has got a justifiable case who's got their own their hat in the ring now. It just kind of depends. Obviously, it's down to Gatland what style he wants, but it is taking shape for sure. I think you can narrow it down to starting 15 to maybe within you know, 23 players, perhaps. I don't say that because it's a squad, just by coincidence. There's about 15 players, give or take another eight or nine, I think, who are going to make that start 15. But as we know, first five warm-up games, that could all change. You know, somebody could play, you got three, four players have a blinder on tour mm. in the first few games and they're right in the test mix. And the same... Same goes with players playing themselves out of it, just like perhaps we've seen in the Six Nations. So it's still, we can talk about it now, but it will still definitely change come the first test. Yeah, and and the other thing is, you guaranteed you lose one or two, either to a ban yeah. or yeah. injury. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Well, I doubt. And Sam, how surprised were you that when uh, the Lions tour a couple of weeks ago was confirmed that it would be happening in South Africa? Because the rumour mill had been going that it was going to be quite a long tour, but all around the UK. Yeah, everything I was, I mean, to be fair, I think it was dealt with very professionally because nothing really leaked out, um, which is good. And that's the way you want it. But like... It's the, the signs were all sound like it was going to be at home, which to be honest, like either or wouldn't have bothered me. Like I, I get that fans love traveling and I doubt fans will be able to travel anyway, but um, the whole thing of going away from home, just to get the Lions tour going, like it'd be good to get Sean's opinion. But if I was still playing, I'd be desperate for the tour to go ahead this summer. I'd be desperate. Like particularly when the boys who were late 20s, 30, they, they don't want to be going wait until they're 33 or, you know, until, for their next tour. Like, they want to get it going. And the most of the most, like, I know the Olympics is was pushed back. That's people's argument. But you've got to think of the consequences of the whole rugby calendar and every yeah. home nation for following summer tours. It would have been really messy yeah. if it was pushed back. So I think they did the right thing playing it this summer. And it's the bonus is in South Africa. It, it, it is better that it's out there. Um, so hopefully nothing... Nothing dramatic happens and we can crack on. Even if they didn't have any fans, we can crack on. 
with a tour away from home. If you want to go away from home, beat the world champions away from home and come back with a silverware. That's what it's all about. You know, you don't really want to have any, you don't have an asterisk next to your name as a winning lion. Oh, but they had a home tour and, you know, all these other reasons. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad there'll be next to no excuses now. You um, obviously captained the, the Lions in the last couple of tours. And I think I presented one of the first programmes with you uh, at Principality after you'd stopped playing for Wales. And those moments I always feel uh, for a player because, you know, you can stand there and say, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. But actually, it's not till maybe the match kicks off. You, it, it feels a little bit different or the players run out of the tunnel onto the field and the anthem happens and it feels a bit different. When this tour heads off to, to South Africa, or when the you know the, the selection is announced on May the sixth, do you think that you're gonna have a little bit of a, a feel of, of what that was like those last couple when you were picked? Yeah, oh, don't get me wrong. When you pitch side, I tell you what I miss, and it's ironically the reason I finished. I miss contact, like I miss just trying to belt someone not legally, <laughs> like you know. I, I like when when the boys are warming up and you can hear the air going out of those pads, like running into the pad, hit the pad in the air, sort of rushes up the pad. Like, I miss that rush of physically dominating or trying to physically dominate someone. Like, that's why you play rugby in the back row anyway, because you love that that physical contact. So, don't be wrong. Like, I, I don't miss um, – I'm not going to miss playing or wish I was playing. So, I know I, I can't do it. I, I know I can't. So, that, that that's easy. Like, I don't feel I could be there and I'm not. Yeah, so we, all, we all say that, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still shocking. <laughs> You're still playing. You're well. 16 to 1 to be on the lines. <laughs> <laughs> How much money have you gotten yourself, Sean? Uh, okay. Someone 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 messaged me that yesterday. That's the only reason I know that. I was like I was <laughs> like, don't waste your money. <laughs> don't waste your money, I said. Keep you, keep your tenor. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm not going to miss like I'm not going to miss like being on that tour. Like I'm happy. Like Shawnee's the same. Like Crikey, mm. two tours. We've been lucky that we've got two tours. Both haven't lost. You know, like, that's brilliant. Like just have a a winning Lions. You know, yeah. and, and we both play Test team, winning Test teams. Like great, happy days. And you're in a minority of rugby players. So yeah, I'm I'm one of those players that you know I find it quite easy. I can. I'm a boots up, put them away. I don't have anything rugby in the house, nothing. I don't need to remind myself like who I've played for, what I've done. You know, I'm happy in, I'm happy in my own skin. Yeah, I'd love to see the other youngsters now chuck on that red shirt and do Britain and Ireland proud, you know. So I, I can't wait to see you know, who the next emerging, you know, world class players are who are gonna put on that test shirt. So yeah, can't wait. So as you mentioned, Sam, uh, people have been picking on the um, Lions Vodafone app their teams. So I'm interested on uh, you and Sean's thoughts. And um, we don't want to take too long on this because, as we've said, it can change. It can change on a weekly basis. But if we just rattle through, starting with uh, the props. Actually, Lee, just, be- just before just before we go ahead yes. with this, we we're talking about like the Lions going away to South Africa. That's very mm. important for the social element of it. Because... <laughs> One of the stories about Warby was after the after we um, drew the series in New Zealand, we had a couple of days after, but one of the days was a court session and we had to go up and there was, I, do you remember this Warby, all the vodka shots? Mate, I passed out in my room for six hours. Yeah, so we were all, we were all turn, looking around going, where's Warby? Like, where's, where is he? Where is he? He has to be here. So he came down, but I, I mean, there must have been 90 or 100 vodka shots on the table. And whoever got punished had to do five or six in a row. I remember I had to go to bed for an hour and a half too and then got back up. But um, oh, Warby, well came, Warby, came, Warby walked into the room and the place went mental. And they proceeded to tear him apart and make him, I don't know how many shots he drank, but he was gone for six hours afterwards anyway. That was him done. So oh, no. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to see that over in England. I'd rather that be away from no. home. <laughs> Keep that on foreign shores. Oh, I remember the court session. Right? We had the court session. I'm like, you know, when you just go to the toilet after when you're when you're doing these court sessions, you just think, like, oh my god, like I'm, you, know, you have a little moment on your own. Like, I'm I'm struggling, so I went back to my room. I thought I got I, I got to get back to my room quick because like boys <laughs> drink right. They, they don't realise Welsh boys know. I, I'm horrendous at drinking. My threshold is probably a quarter of the players right, but you try and keep up. But after an hour and a half, like I'm I'm completely gone. So I went back to my room. And I literally closed the door. I went to the bed, can't, 
next thing I know, I looked at my watch, right, and it was like six hours later. So I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I obviously went back in my room. I've got to find the boys again, you know. Hopefully they haven't got out yet. Found all the boys again. Like, probably got punished again for another hour. And I was back in my room again for another six hours. I was like, <laughs> it, was bru- it was brutal. Like, I was, oh, I, got, I found it real tough. Guys. It was relentless. Do you know what relentless. I like, Sam? The fact, that, the fact that you don't really drink, and yet you probably don't realise you've featured in uh, several drinking stories on this season's House of Rugby because we had George North on as well. <laughs> Talking George, about his stag weekend. George, George hanging out to dry on his stag do. I did genuinely as well, right? I thought, so we went out on the Thursday night, like early Friday morning. We got together Thursday. And I was like, yeah, I got a flight home on Sunday morning. And like, that's when the F1 starts. I'm like, what do you mean? It's on Saturday, obviously. I checked because I didn't know nothing about cars, like Formula <laughs> 1, nothing. So I had to get a flight home on the Sunday. But I did I did two nights from that in Monaco. I, well, we, I saw you. Well, I saw you. <laughs> Um, I, I can't see what happened on Saturday night, but I was again. It was similar to Lion Seventeen. It was just like it was one of those moments. I was like, I, I've got to get out of here quick because I don't want everything to seem like this. And I just again, and the boys they were they were drinking on Saturday, and we were in this like we were in this one area. They were drinking from like breakfast, right? I said, no, but I can't start till half four, boys. Can I have a couple? No, no, no. I, I won't start till half past four because if I start now, I'm going to be gone by three. Like, I can't do it. But I waited till half past four. And I was still the first one out to come out. I'm so, honestly, I'm not going to try you to be macho and make out I can drink. Oh, my goodness. But if you were saying I can't drink, I actually can't drink. I'm an embarrassment. So I will put my hands up there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad we did the social bit here, um, but let's pick our lions, yeah, or you two can pick yeah. your lions. Back to the um, lions, no more stalling, Sam. Uh, who are your props? Okay, I'm going to go with Mako van Apolo and Furlong. And I know a lot of people might say, why Mako, uh, if he hasn't played as strong as Six Nations? I think he'll get back to that level, go on tour. He, he's got the highest ceiling of, for potential out of all the loose heads, so I think Gatton will stick with him. Uh, give him game time early on the tour and hopefully the straps can kind of test series. Yeah, I'd 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 say to stay him for starting and I'd I'd have Keen Keen Healy is still rocking very well at the minute as well. And I'd put him ahead of probably just sitting in behind him. But Tig is a Tig is a shoe in. Um hundred yeah. percent. Hookers. I gone with Ken Owens. And I think if Jamie George was playing Saris at normal, regular level, um, then I, I probably would have gone with Jamie George, but I wonder whether that'll count against him. Uh, again, he might have enough games on tour to play himself back into that team, but um, right now I'd, I'd say Ken Owens. Yeah, I'd probably go Ken as well. Uh, Ken and then Jamie. Um, I think he'll bring Jamie, 100%, but, but, oh, yeah. but yeah. Ken is uh, Ken's to start, I think. Okay, the second row. <clears throat> I changed my mind on this already since I've done an article a week ago. I'm going to go uh, Maratoji and Adam Jones. I did say Tyburn, but I think it might be a little bit of a way to play Tyburn in second row with Maro. Yeah. Uh, so I've got Alan Wynn. You know, he's a big 118 kilo guy. Obviously, his leadership. Um, so I'm going to go with Maro and, and Alan Wynn. I think I know Maro, some people think he didn't have a strong Six Nations, but he'll play himself back into that test team. He's a phenomenal talent. Yeah, I'd agree completely with that. I was thinking about it earlier, just with the the leadership element of it and weight in the scrum, because you're going to be coming up against a big, big Springbok pack and uh, James Ryan on the bench, a second row cover for me. Yeah, I agree. Okay, this is the one that everyone's looking forward to from uh, your point of view, both of you. The back row. Who goes first? Do you want to go Shawnee or me? Yeah, I, I, go, I go first. Uh, oh. Six, I would... Probably go with Ty Byrne at the minute. Uh, seven, uh, Tom Curry. And the eight, the eight, I'm going to go with Toby. Um, just, I don't think Billy is playing well enough. Um, and the boys, there is a few lads ahead of him who have played a lot better during the Six Nations. So it's it's a big one, obviously. Um, obviously, CJ had a good tournament as well. Um. So yeah, but that's that's my back row. Yeah, I agree with seven. I go with Perry. Uh, I agree with number eight. I go Toby, uh, to the bay. And um, number six, I've actually gone Sam Underhill. I know he didn't play any Six Nations, but when he's fit, he punishes people. And I know in South Africa, people say about weight and stuff, but people, yeah, Curry and Underhill are the two tallest back rowers. Um, 
but my God, they're powerful. Like, it's, it's explosiveness, which is what counts when you're playing in flank. You know? Like, Sean, you played against plenty of blokes who are 115 kegs, so they don't pack a punch. But mm-hmm. those two pack a punch. And I got with Underhill, because so I just think from a defensive point of view, um, I think that's a big part why England haven't ticked in defence as much. He's there, one guy herring off the line, just battering people from minute one to 80. And I think he's one of those players who will play for Bath now, hopefully stay injury free. Um, and I think he can have a real big impact in the early games on tour and get into that test team. So I'm going Underhill, Curry, and Falata. Okay, who are your half backs? Uh, Sean, we'll start with you. Um, I thought oh, Connor. I, I thought I thought Connor was the best he's played was the last game. Um, so if he if he continues to hit that form, he'll be there thereabouts. Um, obviously Ben Youngs is playing exceptionally well as well. But it's that that actually this the scrum half position is going to be one that can change a lot over the next yeah. few months. I think. I don't. Yeah, I don't think anyone has really nailed it down. To be fair. Properly nail it down. Um, so, yeah, you have a few there. Davies, obviously, in Wales. Um, you know, Niggly, very good defensively. Um, you know, knows his rugby. So there's there's, mm, there's a few there, but I, I wouldn't say any anyone in particular has it nailed. And then a 10. Oh, everyone, I, I see everyone is kind of like picking Finn, obviously, but I just think... With the way the Lions will play, it'll suit him uh, at certain times. But you just don't know what you're going to get. He could he could throw a pass on his own line in the last minute and we could be winning by 14 or we could be winning by 7. And, you know, anything, anything could go with him, which is the nice thing about it. So, But I think they'll stick with um, Farrell or Biggs. So I was going to, my nine, I think the three nines would be Thomas Williams, uh Connor Murray and Ben Youngs. I think it will be that that race will be changing all the way through the tour yeah. and the next three months. But I've gone with Thomas Williams. He's just got a bit of X Factor, like real X Factor about him. And he's been injured a bit lately, which is why he wasn't in the shot window in Six Nations. But Gats will know all about him. Um, and he is a real X Factor player. You know, people have seen him play enough. He's, he's special. And I think he can play himself into the team if he stays fit. So I, I think Thomas Williams. Uh, and I think he would have been Wales's number one nine had he stayed fit. Uh, ten. I've gone with. Um, I've gone with Sexton. I just think his his leadership. I know there's much more to a game than defence, but you've got to remember against Africa, they're probably going to be running five man lineouts at you and running big eighteen, nineteen stone blokes off five man lineouts straight down to number ten. Like you, you've got to be able to to, to defend at ten big time. Um, playing in South Africa, I'm not saying other guys won't play ten. They might, but I think Sexton with his leadership, his experience. He's the one guy who, I mean, if I was in a dressing room, I want him to steer that ship. You know, he's phenomenal in that sense. Yeah. But, but I will say, if I was still playing and I was in that test team and there was Finn, Ru- I'm not just saying this to be diplomatic, but Finn Russell, Sexton, Bigger, all Owen Farrell, all picked at number 10, I wouldn't bat an eyelid. I'd be honest. So I think we're blessed at 10. It's probably the one position I'm, I'm not worried about. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Who would you have on the wing, Sam? Uh, oh, God. Watson's a shoe in. Also to shoe in. The reason I, I'm, I'm having an hour in is um, well, Zamit is fantastic in attack. Um, I, I haven't seen loads of him being challenged under like high balls, for example. And something like Faf de Klerk is going to be box kicking like crazy. That's what South Africa did to England in the World Cup final. So it's just the defensive capabilities uh, of, a, of a winger is going to be massively important. I don't know whether you go someone like Duan van der Merwe, who is might be a bit stronger under the high ball, or someone like that, a bit bigger, who we know Gatner likes. So I'm trying to think who Gatner would pick. Zamet has to go on tour. He's got X-Factor in attack. Mm. And defence is something you can quite easily coach into a player. So that, that shouldn't be too much of a worry. It doesn't work the other way. You can't give someone Zamet's pace or natural attacking player, you know. So I'm probably going to go with um, Zamet and, and Watson, but I think it's going to be close between Zamet and someone like yeah, I think I think Zamet obviously will definitely go, but um, Watson I think will start. Um, and the other thing is as well, George North could potentially start on the wing. Um, that's uh, you know either eleven or fourteen, but it's uh, definitely between them kind of few players anyway. They picked themselves. I think I did. I think they picked themselves. I think someone like uh, Josh Adams. Is it Josh's yeah. first name, yeah? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think someone like him, Gats, will possibly bring. 
because he is so steady. And what you see is what you get as well. Um, and again, defensively, as you said, Warbs, he'll he's he's sound there. Oh, he's the most fierce. Him and Liam Williams are the most fierce sort of back three players I've seen in the sense of like kick chase and mm. they fly into rucks and they compete on the ball and these are the things that you need. Like you watch all the top back three players in the world, they all jack up like a back row player. Like they like like the, the first player to do it was Brian Driscoll. He was the first. I know he wasn't back three; he was centre. He was one of the first sort of outside backs. Was really prolific in that breakdown area. You've got to be. You've got to be able to produce that area at top top level. So, if you're going off those basics, then that throws Josh Adams right into it. Yeah, yeah. I remember Liam Williams. The last the last Wales game I played, they done a they done a short line out off the tail, and Liam Williams, rather than trying to run around me, ran straight at me. <laughs> I swear to God, it was like it was like running into a brick wall. Um, he absolutely dazzled me. I was like, what am I after hitting here? But yeah. he's he's one of the he's one of the toughest players in in rugby. Fact, oh, uh, yeah, you know, and he, he's all born as well. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. when he when he ran over, he actually ran over the top of me, and I was just holding his legs. But I was like, "What's after hitting me here?" Oh, he's, he's a tough guy, and that's the thing with like say with tackling, for example, you get a lot of people asking you how do you tackle, but you have all the things like if they go to your right, it's a right shoulder hit, left is left shoulder. Up. I'm like, it's tackling's a mindset if you want to get someone to ground you'll get them to ground mm. like if you, you've got to be brave you've got to couple it with technique but Liam Williams is like you say he's one of the bravest players mm. out there no regard for his body no. like, he'd take you on Sean and you probably have like three stone on it but yeah. he, he doesn't yeah. care because he's no. got that mindset he can get away with being 85, 88 yeah. kilos whatever he might be you know over 90 kilos playing against a running at 110 kilo bloke you know yeah. so he's, uh, <laughs> he gets away with it for that reason well, since we've been talking about Liam Williams and some of these places might be interchangeable, uh, let's jump to, to the full back, to the 15 position. W- would he be in with a shout for that, do you think? Is, is, would, he, would you play him at 15 rather than on the wing, Sam? So, this time last year, Lee Halfpenny was played brilliantly. And Lee Halfpenny hasn't featured for Wales, you know, and he was Wales' best player in 2020. It's funny how things change. But right now, you're looking at Hogg or Liam Williams. Uh, Hog of Liam Williams is great in attack. Hog, Hog might just edge him in attack, even though Liam's brilliant in attack. But defensively, you go with Liam. Um, then Hog's been given like leadership. He's got his leadership credentials with Scotland. And can't forget some of the big wins that they've had. Like he's mm. England, that was fantastic for them and for him to go through. And Hog was in a sort of I don't like differentiating between midweek and Saturday, but he was in the Saturday team in the Lions tour until he got his cheekbone fracture or whatever he did. You know, he, he was starting 15 against Crusaders, which was taking shape to be the test team. I think he was first in line to that 15 shirt going back four years ago. It would have been tied between maybe Liam Williams and him both would have featured, you know, one on yeah. the wing, one at fullback. Um, but right now, I, I went with Hogg right now, but I guess that one will be decided by who plays better in the early games on tour. So Liam Williams or, or Hogg, but right now I'm going to, I think, Hogg might edge it. Yeah, I, I think I think Hogg to start um at the minute on, on, on his form at the minute. I think he's I think he's stopped doing silly things in games and I think he's stopped playing like trying stuff himself and he's really playing for the team now. And it's it's brought his game to another level, I think. Because even when you were scouting Hogg years ago, you'd always say if he was under pressure he'd try and pull something out of his hat for himself, like not for the boys around him. And I think that's gone. I think I think he's I think he's recognise that and, and actually stuck now to the plan like whatever plan they have in place um, the other one I was thinking was Liam Williams will obviously be there 100% um, what do you think Key Earl's on the wing that's, that's yeah, he's been so good you're right that's a good show no one, no, one has, no one has spoke about him no one's mentioned no, him in any of the no. teams but he's been unbelievable yeah. no you're right actually you know, I, 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 I agree because I was watching a game the other day that he was playing it, I thought, God, is there many people who would have gone on a Lions tour, like four tours of well, like 09, and then go on tour to 2021? I'm not sure that's happened before, where somebody sort of leapfrog two tours and come back into the mix again. Yeah. But yeah, that's a great shout. And he's versatile as well, isn't he? He's yeah, he can, he can play, so, he can um, play in the centre, yeah. Does, I think. Very good shout. Yeah, we, and a man we, in a dollar would put a tweet out saying that he was the, um, that Keith Earls yeah. was the most underrated winger in world rugby, so... Uh, a nice little shout there. So just uh, very quickly, just to finish off the centres, Sean, mm-hmm. your Irish boys would be in with a, a pretty good shout, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, I think I think Henshaw. I think Henshaw at the minute, the way he's playing, and if he continues on that, like there's no one to touch him there. The way he's played the last few games, he's been a leader defensively. He's been brilliant in attack. He's 
Uh, he's just been he's been phenomenal, to be fair. And then that's a twelve, a thirteen. Then I, I like thirteen is a tricky position, I think. And I think George North has done a brilliant, brilliant job on it. Mm-hmm. But people, I don't think people realise how good Gary Ringrose is um, when he's on form. And I know he's injured at the minute, but f- the defensively unbelievable and in attack slips the first tackle gets space for himself all the time so he's going to be in the picture as well I think and then depending on who's back from injury like is Tulagi going to be back um, in the fold you've obviously Jonathan Davies hits another bit of form um, get, get him out get him out from under the table and, and get him back <laughs> get him get him back uh, doing what he loves um, but like he's he's obviously going to be in the picture too because Gats knows what he can bring on the big days yeah I agree with Henshaw I think his 12s go he's been like, like out and out 12 as well yeah. like he's definitely the best out and out 12 um, and he's played well before the Six Nations for Leinster when he came back as well so he's been playing well for quite a while now uh, a good few months and then 13 I go with George just because he's that guy who could pop up for X Factor moments I agree Gary Ringrose will be close he'll definitely be going on tour for me I'll definitely pick him mm. on tour but George is just that guy who can just get the ball with a one on one and just score for nothing so I think that that edges him I'm giving his physicality as well uh, that legend to, to 13 yeah. for me yeah. uh, Sam one for, finally before we uh, all head off uh, who would be your captain <laughs> <laughs> It's so hard. I, I said an idea. But so right now, Alan Wynn is the obvious guy to pick as a tour captain. But I only say this from personal experience. It kind of goes against the grain a little bit. But do you pick a, like, because I always picked as captain for the last two tours. Like, and, and I was playing well at both Six Nations. And then I got injured for three months before both tours, which was a killer for me. Yeah. Um, and then it took me about four games on tour, three, four games on tour. So I started getting anywhere back near, hit my straps. I just think, do you, do you announce the tour captain saying that the test captain is still yet to be decided? Obviously, the tour captain is going to be front runner, but it just takes the pressure off Alan Wynn if it was Alan Wynn a little bit. So, Alan Wynn, I mean, like, God, oh, it's hard to look past him given his experience and Wales have won. Before the Six Nations, I picked Owen Farrell or Maratoji because I thought the squad was going to be dominated with at least a third of English players. So, naturally, you're going to pick a captain which has where the majority of players are. Uh, if there was going to be only, say, say Wales or Pats, Alan Wynn was great, it would still be tough to pick him as captain because you might, if you only had like two or three players on tour who were from your nation, it is a lot more difficult to be captain when you've got a lot of players. But So now Wales have had a good campaign, a better campaign. Alan Wynn's a much stronger candidate, even though he'd always be in, in the mix. So i got to go with Alan Wynn as a tour captain and I'd say test captain is, is yet to be decided just to take the pressure off. And Sam, people can get involved at home, can't they, through the app that you're uh, part of? Yeah, I think the fans, I mean, I, I love it. I've been chatting about, I can talk Lions for, for hours. I love the debate. But you can go on the, the squad selector on the official Vodafone Lions app uh, and pick your team. And the, the Lions have actually tweeted on Instagram to say what the fans have said. And you've got some really interesting picks, actually. A lot of fans have all gone for Finn Russell at 10 and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great just to sort of throw your, your hat into the ring and pretend you're a coach. But I'm not going to lie, the one thing I've realised doing all these is I could never coach the Lions because there are so many hard calls. Like, and people yeah. throw, like, say throw away comments like, oh, you need to get back into coaching. Or, you need to be Wales coach and Lions coach. So, like, you've got, like, in the nicest way, you've got no idea what a coach goes to. Like, mm. flip and egg. They, they are under some massive yeah. pressure, big calls non-stop you know like coaching I, I couldn't do that so like I can do it for a bit of fun but to actually make that call for uh, that's why they get paid the big bucks isn't it but um, if anyone knows how to make a big call yeah it's Gatlin Sam last yes, question for- last question on the Lions actually sorry Lee Sam Simmons yes or no in or out if Sam Simmons goes on tour he's not a bolter because he's been playing so well yeah. so I think Sam Simmons for me should be a shoe in I would go uh, Simmons and uh, Simmons and Toby uh, uh, should go as number eight. Mm. And then you've somehow got to narrow down Ender Hill, Curry, uh, Navidi, and Tipperick and Watson. <laughs> How are you going to do that? I don't know. <laughs> we cannot start this conversation all over again. This is going to be like a three hour podcast. <laughs> Gents, thank you very much for your company. It's been so interesting listening to both of your insights. Thank you very much to you at home for watching, for listening, and we'll do it all again next week. Bye bye. You've been watching the House of Rugby season three on Joe.